Hello, and welcome to the Science of Skin United Beyond the Surface. We thank you for joining us for a morning of conversation, inspiration, and change making. To kick things off, please welcome Therapeutic Area Head of Dermatology for U.S. Medical Affairs at AbbVie, Judy Mundaka. I'm Judy Mundaka, and I lead Dermatology for U.S. Medical Affairs at AbbVie. Some of you know that back in 2020, AbbVie hosted our first Science of Skin, highlighting chronic inflammatory skin disorders such as psoriasis, hydrodenitis suppurativa, and as you know, these are highly distressing and can be disfiguring diseases that do have deep psychological impact on, on, on patients. Our second Science of Skin event is today, and today we, it's designed to go deeper into the disparities that exist in dermatology, from barriers for physicians to challenges that, that directly affect patients. As you'll see in a minute or so, we're joined by an amazing panelist, some HCPs, patient advocates, and caregivers. Despite the efforts across the dermatology community today, there continues to be opportunities to see, to close the gaps in racial disparities in our industry. And the time is now. AVI is committed to equity, equality, diversity, and inclusion. In today's discussion, we hope we can come together as thought leaders and change makers and help make an impact in dermatologic care for all patients, including patients of color. We're being very intentional here at AVI, uh, intentional in how we uh, recruit in our clinical trial to ensure diversity, and the time is now. We do look forward to a very robust discussion. Let's look at our agenda today. We'll have two sessions and a short break in between. There'll be time for each session for us to have an interactive Q&A. Our first session will be moderated by Caroline Robinson of Tone Dermatology. We will go deep into how the skin conditions present very differently in patients of color. Our dermatologist panel will share their clinical experience on how they diagnose and treat patients of color while sharing thoughts on how we can close this gap in patient care. Then, the second session will be moderated by Dr. Simal Desai, Clinical Associate Professor of Dermatology at the University of Texas Southern Medical. We'll focus on the patient and the caregiver experience, understanding the emotional, the social, and the psychological challenges patients face, especially patients of color who live with these chronic inflammatory skin disorders. But first, let's kick off, before we kick off our session, let's do a few housekeeping items. We've got some social media guidelines. We encourage you to post any of your learnings on, on, on perspective on social media, including still images of our speakers. We ask that you paraphrase anything being discussed in your own words. Feel free to hashtag, to, to tag a panelist and use science of skin hashtag on your posts. Please refrain from capturing or posting audio or video of any of our speakers or sessions and pictures of any slides that will be displayed on the screen. If you have any questions following the event, please reach out to AVI Public Affairs team. Let's, go, let's get to it right now. Our first panel our discussion would be, is called Seeing Color in Medical Dermatology, How Skin Color Shapes Access, Care, and Experience. We'll hear from leading healthcare providers on the current state of health equity in dermatology. There'll be Q&A session following this presentation. Please feel free to drop questions in the Q&A as they come up versus waiting till the end of the, of the session. Please let me introduce the moderator, Dr. Carolyn Robinson. She is the, a board certified medical and cosmetic dermatologist based in Chicago. Dr. Robinson is the founder of Tone Dermatology and specializes in alopecia, preventative skin care and ethnic skin dis, uh, dermatology. 
She is active in the Skin of Color Society, Women's Dermatologic Society, and AAD, American Academy of Dermatology. She's also a clinical associate at the University of Chicago. Welcome, Dr. Robinson. Thank you for that introduction, Judy. I'm very excited to be moderating this panel today, and I'm joined by three fantastic panelists. I would like to get into the discussion, but first, let's go around and have each of the panelists introduce themselves and tell us why it was so important for them to be here today. Let's start with Dr. Desai. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Robinson, and it's such a pleasure to be here as part of this Science of Skin event. I'm Samal R. Desai. I'm a board-certified dermatologist in private and academic practice in Dallas, Texas. I'm the founder of Innovative Dermatology and on faculty at the University of Texas Southwestern. And my practice and career has really spanned the depth of skin of color dermatology, and I'm really excited to be able to share some of my interests and expertise in treating diseases that predominantly affect patients of color, such as psoriasis, vitiligo, acne, especially also from a clinical trials perspective, which I know we're gonna talk about today. So I'm really excited to dive into this discussion with you and my fellow colleagues, and I look forward to a robust dialogue. Amazing, Dr. Shi. Hello everyone, I'm Vivian Shi. I'm also a board certified dermatologist. I'm currently an associate professor of dermatology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, where I see complex inflammatory conditions, including but not limited to hydroadenitis, atopic dermatitis, and psoriasis alike. I also have a special interest in clinical trials where I direct our clinical trials operation. Where I practice, I see a large number of skin of color patients, and I'm in the forefront being able to drive these changes by being a member of the HS Foundation, the Hydroadenitis Foundation. And so I'm passionate about identifying disparities in patients and communities and working with all stakeholders to identify knowledge gaps, practice gaps, and clinical trials gaps. Hopefully we can break these barriers all together to level the playing ground. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Great. And last but not least, Dr. Farley. Well, thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Farley, and I'm uh, very happy to be here and very excited to have this really important conversation with you all today. Um, I'm also a board certified dermatologist, and uh, I'm on a clinical faculty at UNLV and at Toro University, as well as uh, in private practice at, at Vivita Dermatology. And uh, I as well, my clinic is located in an area that's a pretty diverse population in Las Vegas, um, and we definitely have a lot of skin of color patients. Uh, I also uh, volunteer regularly um, at a, a clinic called Volunteers of Medicine in Southern Nevada, where monthly I see patients uh, that uh, have no access to insurance. So same thing, although uh, patients of any color can experience it, certainly there's a, a significant number of patients um, of color that experience that as well. So being able to also, I, I think it's important to make sure we try to bridge those patients' access to care, um, which is you know something I think we're gonna discuss today as well. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us today. For full disclosure, myself and all of the speakers here are being compensated by Abby for our participation. During this discussion, we'll cover chronic inflammatory skin conditions like atopic dermatitis, also known as eczema, hydradenitis superativa, psoriatic disease, which tends to present differently on skin of color. So let's begin. First, I would like to hear a little bit more about the state of diversity in dermatology. And would you be able to provide us with an overview, Dr. Desai? I'd be happy to. And I think uh, that's a really important discussion, Caroline. And I hope that's something that we talk about throughout the whole panel today with all of you experts as well. You know, I think we have a, a beautiful specialty. Dermatology is, is really uh, a, a really astounding field. We cover so many diseases of the hair, skin, and nail, thousands of disorders, and we tr all treat thousands of patients every year. Mm -hmm. But certainly, we need to understand that our communities of color and our underrepresented populations, in general, really want to seek out physicians who truly understand their own skin type, their ethnicity, their backgrounds, and, and really, patients say when asked these questions in surveys and studies, they want to see doctors that look like them, that know them, that know their backgrounds. And I think that's an important thing we need to keep in mind when you're really trying to develop that patient-physician relationship. I'll give you a couple important statistics. If you look at the dermatology workforce and you look at some of the data in clinical trials, and you go back to just recently, in 2015, there was a study that showed only 3 to 4% of U.S. dermatologists are from an African-American black background. 
and only about 4% of U.S. dermatologists are Hispanic. Even a similar number from an Asian or a different ethnic background. And so what that helps us to know is that even from a physician perspective, it's not as diverse as maybe we would like because we want patients to be able to identify with the doctor who's treating them. And that's kind of astounding because if you think by 2042, more than half of the U.S. population is going to be skin of color, we need to make sure that we as physicians really mirror and keep up with those trends. I'll also mention another big gap, and I know we're going to talk about this later, Caroline, is clinical trials. Right. And clinical trials are so important because clinical trials, especially from organizations like AbbVie and others, help us deliver medications to help treat our patients, especially patients who are suffering from inflammatory skin disease. So one of the things that I think is critically important is not only how do we deliver the care, but how do we do the research effectively so that we can get products and treatments for many of these diseases. You know, in dermatology, as, as you all know, we have a lack of FDA-approved treatments for lots of the diseases we treat. Mm -hmm. But then compound that with a clinical trial that may not have enough patients of color or a representation of patients of color in that clinical trial's data. And I think we sort of set ourselves up for a little bit of a quandary on how we're gonna continue to proceed. But I, I will tell you that there's great news because sessions like today, this summit, uh, much of the work that's being done by organizations like the Skin of Color Society, like AbbVie, like many others, are really moving that needle. And so what I really think our, our viewers need to know is that this is an issue that we are aware of and actively working to address. And it's not just something that's happening now. It's something that's been happening and continues to sort of evolve into importance. So I look forward to talking a little bit more and hearing my fellow panelists' perspective. Absolutely. And... Um, let's also hear a little bit more. You mentioned skin conditions can present differently on different skin tones. Can you tell me a bit more about that and some of the challenges providers face when diagnosing and treating these conditions? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a huge, important point, and I think that's a challenge even for us. You know, the four mm -hmm. of us on this panel are experts in doing this, and even we get challenged from time to time. You know, I have a busy private practice, as I mentioned. I also do lots of clinical trials and teaching. And there's times where I don't know the answer either. And you know, you have to sort of think outside the box. So let's, let's use a specific disease state example of psoriasis. Very, very common inflammatory skin disease. Psoriasis tends to be very itchy, chronic in nature, can also affect patients of all ages, and oftentimes presents with these very thick, scaly, itchy plaques, classically on the elbows or knees or scalp or other parts of the body. But psoriasis is one of these diseases that exceedingly as common in dermatology right. and has great therapies, but we have no cure. Mm -hmm. And then in many patients of color, just like the images you can see on the slide, it can look very different. Mm -hmm. And so one of the challenges is how do you diagnose a patient with psoriasis when everything you've learned about psoriasis doesn't fit to the patient who's sitting in you in your exam room coming in for a visit that day? So if you think of psoriasis as being a itchy red disease and you have a darker skin type patient come in, an African American patient or a Southeast Asian patient who's darkly skin type, and it doesn't look red and flaky and scaly, it looks more brown and dark uh, with no scale. Is that psoriasis or is it not? And so one of the challenges uh, becomes how do you appropriately diagnose effectively early on in that disease process? I think all of us have seen patients like that where you know, they come in and you sort of think to yourself, why haven't you come to, been to a dermatologist before? Right. Mm -hmm. Now you have hyperpigmentation or darkening, you have scarring, uh, there's skin changes. And, and psoriasis is a classic example of that because a lot of times many patients don't come to see us or see a board certified dermatologist until their disease is much more uh, progressed and unfortunately then becomes much more of a challenge to treat. So, you know, just to kind of summarize what that means in my practice. We, we see thousands of patients with skin of color every year. We're a large referral center. Every patient who comes in with psoriasis isn't always diagnosed. I've had patients come in and say, oh, I, I didn't know what psoriasis was. You know, my whole life I was told this is dry, ashy skin. Right. And I hear that all the time. I was just told I have eczema. I was just told this is dryness. Just put some lotion on it. Use cocoa butter. Use Vaseline. And those sort of stories constantly sort of come up. And it breaks your heart when you see these patients because they have a inflammatory right. medical skin condition that can be helped if you just help it at the right time and you see the right specialist. So I think this is a huge topic 
for yeah. us, especially when we talk about diseases like psoriasis and eczema and HS. Right, exactly. And speaking of inflammatory skin conditions, um, Dr. Shi, you also have some familiarity with treating atopic dermatitis, hydratinitis in your practice. I would love if you could give us an overview of atopic dermatitis specifically and how it might present differently on skin of color. Sure, happy to. So atopic dermatitis is also commonly known as eczema, but eczema is a really term that describes anything that's rashy. So they're really the the correct term for atopic dermatitis is classic eczema. It's the most common type of eczema. And it's quite common. It can occur in any part of the body. The most common concern and symptoms patient may have is itching. And that can affect multitude part of the life, sleep, work, career, you name it. And um, it's commonly more severe and burdensome for a multitude of reasons in people of skin of color compared to their European descent counterparts. And that can be due to the way the pathophysiology is, the differential different presentation, and also a number of socioeconomic factors and health literacy factors and access factors to dermatologists and specialists that by the time they present, their disease is more severe. And so when we think about atopic dermatitis, the common presentation is these scaly red plaques in these you know, hot areas, typically in children that will be more common on the face and kind of in the skin folds, kind of in the inner arms. As we grow, the anatomical distribution may change to more of a dorsal surface, kind of like you know, back of the hands and whatnot. But overwhelmingly, itch is the most common concern. And eczema, it's just like psoriasis. It presents differently in people of different color. In fair-skinned individuals, typically it's more of a salmon-colored, red, and scaly. And that's what most of our textbook and educational materials has been. And for myself, having gone through medical school you know, in the past 15 years, and that's not a long time ago, right? Yeah. I went back and looked at my medical textbook. Most of the photos of eczema and chronic inflammatory conditions are of people of fair skin. But like what Dr. Desla had mentioned, our diverse population is changing in the United States and our practices are changing. So it's really important that we are aware of the differential presentation in people of skin color. They don't look salmon color. They don't look always look pink. In darker skin individuals, erythema or redness is commonly not pink, but more purple, sometimes bruise-like and brown color. And for that reason, it may be hard to, you know, differentiate the lesional and non-lesional skin for some people and accurately grade the severity of them. And this is a challenge for my current residents and students as well who are taking care predominantly skin of color individuals, but the textbook is of lighter skin. And so um, there are unique features in eczema that's more common in skin of color. For example, the skin typically is drier. It tends to be more ashy, like what Dr. Desai had mentioned. And there's more, you know, bumpiness around the hair follicles. And paragonodularis are, is a special type of, you know, lesion that's more common in skin of color individuals. And because we have trouble identifying redness in skin of color, we need to use other signs to differentiate mild, moderate to severe disease. And this could be using putting our hands on the skin to make sure, you know, see if there are any roughness, using our hand to feel for swelling or heat, and all the other clues we can use to not only diagnose, but to help, um, you know, accurately as, uh, you know, differentiate the different severity of the diseases. And so for African American, for example, you may often have people come in saying, I have ashy skin, or I just have dark color on my skin. But it's not until we elicit the history and do a full exam do we understand that there is actually profound skin inflammation that may be easily mixed, uh, a miss. So we have a lot of work to do in this area for atopic dermatitis, and I hope to work with all of you here, not on the, only on the panel, but in the audience, is to, like I say, I always say, break down the barriers, get the education, because the brain doesn't know what it doesn't see. And so we hope to to change this in the near future. Absolutely, absolutely. So important to address that. And you mentioned textbooks, Dr. Shi. I wanted to also share that as part of my relationship with Allergan Aesthetics and the DREAM Initiative, which is an initiative that works to drive racial equity through physician training, Euro addressing Eurocentric notions of beauty and racial bias in aesthetic medicine, we've released an inclusive full color atlas that 
visually teaches dermatologists, visually teaches residents how to recognize those signs of skin conditions on different skin tones. So since the launch in 2021, the Atlas has already reached more than 1,800 residents more than 140 programs and is making a great impact on dermatologists and dermatology training. So it's a wonderful step in the direction, but as you mentioned, we all need to work together to continue to address this. So now I would love if uh, you could share a little bit more about hydradenitis supertiva, which I know is something that you're passionate about and is something that maybe our audience may not have heard of before. So. Sure, absolutely happy to. So hydroadenitis is also called HS. It's previously thought to be an orphan disease because we thought it was very rare, but now we know that it's not rare at all. It's actually very common. Um, it's one of the most debilitating skin conditions I've ever taken care of. And being able to take care of people with HS has truly been the most humbling part of my career. Um, these patients come in with painful, you know, draining bumps and nodules, typically affecting the skin folds, uh, such as the underarms, below the breasts in women, and the groin folds and buttock. But any part of the skin that has hair bearing, you know, uh, areas can, other than the palms and soles, you can get HS anywhere. And um, oftentimes it affects African Americans and skin of color more often than lighter skin individuals. Um, and women of bare childbearing potential less than 40 years of age is actually the most commonly affected groups. And where I practice in Little Rock, Arkansas, we see a profound disparity between the time they come into the doctor and um, you know, Caucasian individuals compared to skin of color. And I have the privilege of starting the first um, hydroadenitis specialty clinic in my state. And we get referrals all throughout the state and the surrounding area. So we've been very fortunate to be able to provide specialty care for these patients. What's tricky about HS um, is that not many people and not many providers are familiar with this. And part of it is because in medical school, we probably get two weeks of dermatology. And within dermatology, if you flip through the textbook historically, we probably got one paragraph on hydroadenitis if we're lucky. And even as a dermatology resident, because traditionally it's not a disease that we see a lot or you know, it's thought to be orphan disease, even you know, dermatologists um, have a lack of you know, familiarity with the disease. But that's, not, that's changing due to a lot of the research that's happening and the work that Avi is doing as well. And so when we think about HS, in skin of color individuals, you know, while more work is being done, we don't exactly know how that presents differently across skin of color. But it's thought that in skin of color individuals, especially in black patients, they may have more exuberant scarring, and that have may have profound effect in terms of treatment. They may appear to respond less rapidly to certain treatments, and during surgical procedures, um, they may heal differently, and they may form more keloidal and hypertrophic scars. And I think one of the challenges of taking care of HS patients is how do we design a multimodal treatment that's comprehensive? And how do we address the multiple comorbidities associated with it to address the first part? Um, unlike many other diseases where, you know, one or two treatment is able to get us to the finishing line and gain quality of life, we don't have that in HS yet. So this treatment toolbox will include lifestyle modifications, topical medications, um, systemic medications as oral or injectable, and importantly for some people, procedural treatments. So finding the right provider who has the toolbox and knowledge to help you design that toolbox is very important. And we have a limited number of providers who do this across the country. And the secondly is to um, actually um, have realistic expectations of what to, you know, what treatment outcome is. You know, it would be so nice um, if we have a drug that can get 100% cure for HS. We're not there yet. And so we're really improving the quality of life and helping them, you know, gain, um, you know, a power and gain um, courage to, you know, go to school, um, to be more active and be able to hopefully advocate for the disease. And um, for clinical trials, traditionally, there's, even though it, HS affects many skin of color patients, there's limited reporting on the racial and ethnic backgrounds for these inflammatory diseases. And also skin of color patients are underrepresented, and, but that is changing for the better. So that's kind of the overview for HS. 
Perfect, thank you. That was very informative. And I would love actually to hear from you, Dr. Farley. You're doing very important work in skin of color as well. And I would like to hear about your clinical experience. Yeah, no, uh, uh, you know, like everyone has been saying, I think some of the challenges are just that things present differently. So mm -hmm. like whenever I have students or, or rotators with me, one big thing I always tell them is make sure when you are looking up a clinical condition, look at the background skin. If it doesn't match your patient skin, then you can't necessarily think that's what it's going to always look like. Ideally, you want to find a picture that looks similar to what your patient looks like, and that'll give you the best correspondence to, you know, is that the disease you're looking at or not. But um, the other thing, too, is, um, you know, especially for something like HS, like you were mentioning, you know, it tends to come up in areas where skin come together. And, of course, it includes areas like the groin and the buttocks, things like that, which, of course, are more sensitive. And so people don't always feel very comfortable about, you know, showing those areas. Um, a lot of times they're they're made to be felt that potentially it was their fault that they had this condition, like you were saying, as far as lifestyle modifications, but it was something that almost like they were purposely doing to, to and that we all know that's not true at all. Um, the other thing, too, is that for patients overall, we know one of the big things that can be a hindrance to them being compliant with their medication it, or their treatment overall is just understanding the condition they have as well as the treatment options. So being able to, as Dr. Desai was saying, like look like our patients and then being able to even potentially address any language barriers and speak to the patient in their language also helps to make them more comfortable with ultimately fulfilling those treatments and then hopefully getting their uh, condition under control as soon as possible because as Dr. She was mentioning that you know fortunately and especially for something like HS the longer you wait it's significantly harder to get it under control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. And so, so now that we have an idea of the different ways that skin conditions can present in skin of color, uh, let's get into a little bit more insight on the clinical experiences. Um, and let's talk a little bit about how we can work as a community to address the, the gap in treatment and close that gap. Um, Dr. Desai, maybe you can start us off with some <laughs> suggestions. <laughs> Well, you know, I mentioned earlier the importance of clinical trials and research. And that's a topic that I am incredibly passionate about because if we don't have the data mm -hmm. and we don't have the research, then it's gonna be much harder to convey to policymakers, to do advocacy, to convince patients, and frankly, to encourage and educate the public when they need to see a dermatologist for their skin disease. So clinical trials, I think, are a huge important component of the incredible amount of work that we've already done, but that we need to continue to do. So let me give you a few specific examples. I mentioned in my practice in Dallas, I do lots of clinical trials. And one of the benefits I have of being in a large metropolitan city is the ability to recruit lots of patients into clinical trials. Now, patients seek my practice out because they know I focus on skin of color. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's incredibly easy to recruit patients from a various diverse background because that's my patient population. But I would say that I'm more of the exception and not the rule because the vast majority of clinical trials centers throughout the country tend to recruit more lighter skin tone patients. And the way we know that is because you look at the data. Now I'll give you a couple of encouraging uh, little factoids, if you will. The Food and Drug Administration now actually has specific benchmarks when they look at new drug applications. They don't even want to encourage you to submit a drug application unless you've demonstrated that you have a diverse clinical trial patient population. So one of the ways that we continue to advocate for more funding, for more partnership with industry, for more advocacy for our patients is to make sure we're recruiting patients with color into clinical trials to get that representative data for the hydradenitis suppurativa, for the psoriasis, for the atopic dermatitis. Now, the other thing is when you do clinical trials, we need the company partners and our industry friends to pick investigators and sites and research organizations that specifically actively look for investigators that they know can recruit patients from a diverse background. So it's not enough to have a study now of 5,000 patients with psoriasis and have 20 patients of darker skin tones. Mm -hmm. That's just not gonna fly anymore like it probably did 20 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So we really need to work together. As an investigator, I know I need to recruit more patients with skin of color into my trials. That's what we're actively doing. But I also need my company colleagues to pick other co-investigators in other cities around the country. 
Obviously, metropolitan areas, this mm -hmm. is easier. Rural areas, this is more of a challenge. And if you think about the number of patients who come to see us who have suffered with their disease for so long, I think that's a really important way that we educate the public. You know, social media is a huge part of this event today. Uh, public education on social media about seeing a board-certified dermatologist, getting involved in clinical research, helping others, I think is a very, very powerful message. I will also mention that patients of color tend to sometimes be wary and tend to sometimes be nervous about being enrolled in clinical trials, and that's rightfully so, especially if you think about what's happened over the previous 100 years in our country in the healthcare system with systemic racism and other issues related to earlier on drug development. Uh, it's understandable why many of our marginalized communities would feel that, you know, I really don't really want to be in an investigator study. I don't want to be an experiment. I just want to make sure I get a treatment for my disease. And so a lot of that comes down to us as the doctor explaining that in that patient-physician relationship. I'll, I'll also briefly mention that a lot of our organizations are actively involved. So if you're a patient tuning in today or if you're a media blogger or if you're part of helping us spread this message, organizations like the Skin of Color Society, for example, have a great find a dermatologist feature. You go to the Skin of Color Society website, skinofcolorsociety.org, you click the button, you type in your zip code, or you type in, hey, I have psoriasis, or I think I have hydradenitis. It'll give you a list of board certified dermatologists who are members of the Skin of Color Society that are the true experts, and then you know who to go to. So you won't necessarily waste your time trying to figure out which is the best doctor for me. You've got a resource there. And I'll also mention that the American Academy of Dermatology just recently launched a skin of color curriculum, mm -hmm. which helps to educate residents and medical students, you know, Dr. Farley and Dr. Shee, and you mentioned the importance of education. There are resources out there. So I encourage all of you who are joining us today for the summit to make sure you take advantage of those resources and share that, because I think educating the public is a huge part of our journey and what we're trying to accomplish here. Thank you. Those were great resources. And this has actually been an incredible discussion. I would like to know if there's anything else that, <clears throat> that you feel like we haven't spoken about today that uh, any of the panelists would like to add um, to the conversation. Um, well, I think one thing that's also important to recognize as well is not just the differences in the color of the skin, but also uh, differences culturally as far as, you know, so uh, some patients, uh, uh, depending on their culture, you know, may embrace doing more uh, uh, herbal treatments or things like that. And I think for us to try to make it more of a collaborative treatment together, you can't just blow it off. You know, unfortunately, those treatments didn't work or then they wouldn't be there. But then, you know, you work with them to figure out, okay, what's our next step from here or you know some some cultures may it be five or six family members that are in the room that day and that's great too I mean I, I again I think as far as for uh, uh, educating the patients in our community there's nothing better than if you can have multiple people hearing what you have to say as opposed to having to play a telephone game and then at least everyone knows what's going on and they can make a collaborative decision together but I think embracing those cultural differences and allowing them to uh, present so that we can give our patients the best treatment is is really important. I think that's huge. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. cultural competency, mm -hmm. listening to our patients. So, yeah, I agree with Dr. Farley. I just want to add um, it's true, cultural sensitivity is a big part of being a dermatologist. Mm -hmm. You know, we are in a profession where, thankfully, not every day people are dying on us, but we live in a world where we're improving quality of life and understanding their life is important. Skin tone and pigmentation is one thing, but what comes with that is our story, our culture, our beliefs too. And I don't think we can be a good practitioner without understanding that. I'll give you an example. Um, in the East Asian culture, um, it's thought that um, any skin inflammation, rash, right, whether it's psoriasis or atopic derm or acne or HS is due to heat, like too much heat coming out of the skin. And oftentimes, like you mentioned, um, we will use herbal remedies at home to help the disease. So as a you know, practitioner, I think it's a, and it's, we need to be aware of what people are doing at home. 
and um, be open to what they're doing and not marginalize these things that people are doing um, you know, at home. But also more important is to how do we strategically work with these patients and family to understand that while herbal remedies done with the right practitioner could be helpful, but there are certain diseases in terms of, especially those who are more moderate to severe, we really need good prescription medications that work together strategically to bring home the win. And right? so that's important. Another example is I can think of is um, you know, burning incense or having aromatherapy at home and being someone who's interested in atopic dermatitis, we see that these home practices can flare atopic dermatitis and give airborne dermatitis. And so understanding these is really helpful. And as we're designing treatments, there can be some resistance on what we're recommending um, when we're trying to take away you know, what the family's been doing for decades and decades. And so um, I think we can work together to understand cultural sensitivity and apply that to people um, who are more richly pigmented. Thank you, thank you for that insight. I think we'll go to some questions now from the audience um, and feel free to leave any. We're going to get started with our very first question uh, now. So how can healthcare providers best support patients with skin of color. Let's start with you, Dr. Shi. Yeah, so I think the best thing we can do is listen and understand. Um, understanding the patient journey, I think is very important. For example, people with HS, their patient journey sometimes can be, you know, seven to eight years according to epidemiologic studies, but we know in my practice, it's much, you know, longer than that. It can be decades before they you know, get a proper diagnosis. And common, oftentimes they may see 10 to 15 providers before reaching a diagnosis. So understanding the barrier of how they got here is important. And that will allow us to design a treatment plan according to their confidence. So if someone has been doing, you know, say a medication for many years without success, that's important for us to know. So we don't do the exact same treatment, but build on top of that and use a different type of treatment to get home to get to bring the efficacy and confidence of what we have. The other thing I think about is health literacy. Um, in people's skin color, oftentimes there's a lower health literacy and the educational material that historically has been written at college level or higher. The American Medical Association recommends that all patient facing material should be written in probably an eighth grade level or lower and we're working towards that. And that way we can better educate our families and patients and make our job a little bit easier too. Yep, yeah. Dr. Farley, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I mean, I, you hit the nail on the head because that was exactly what I was going to say as far as listening. You know, I think so many of our patients, you know, what they ultimately need from us is sometimes the thing that we're the tightest on is time, you know. But uh, uh, I'm sure you all have heard it as well, you know, patients that feel like that their uh, clinician came in the room and left about two seconds later, didn't touch them, didn't anything, and then they're like... I wait, I waited six months for this and I got six seconds, you know? Um, so I, I think just really making sure that the, uh, to listen to the patients, to make sure they feel heard. Um, and, and like you said, to hear their story, because it doesn't make sense to, or to be like, oh yeah, that's what that is. And here's this and bye. And like, but I've already done this, you know, it's like, if you'd let me talk for two seconds, I, I would have told you, but you know, so that then you can come up with a much more collaborative plan. And also too, you can be more collaborative with the education to make sure they truly understand what the condition is, what's involved with it, and then how you move forward to get it treated. So, yeah, that and that just leads to better care. Right? Exactly, exactly. So, Dr. Desai, uh, do you have some input on how healthcare providers can help? Well, I I completely echo what 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 Dr. Farley and Dr. She said. You know, I think listening and asking questions is paramount. You know, that that should be something obvious, but it's not always obvious. You know, we're we're all busy. We have to have long wait times for patients to get to see us, and, and we work in challenging environments. But taking the time to listen and ask those questions is important. But let's, one thing that I think let's do is take a step back. You know, patients with skin disease suffer. Mm -hmm. Skin disease is not trivial. You know, there's thousands of diseases that affect the skin, hair, and nails. You think about the skin being the largest organ. Well, guess what? The skin's also what everyone else in the world sees of you. And so if you think about the psychological impact and burden that skin disease has on an individual. I think that really helps to kind of reset and, and help us understand what these patients are experiencing. I think most of you know, from my own experience, uh, I, I became a dermatologist focusing on skin of color because of my own family's journey mm -hmm. with skin disease. My younger brother suffered from vitiligo at a very early age and 
That's one of the reasons that I focus on that disease and many of the ones we talked about today in communities of color, because I saw what happens when you come from a different cultural background like mine, when you have a skin disease, you're stigmatized, mm -hmm. you're, you're cornered out, you're, you don't feel accepted, and that doesn't affect only the patient. That yeah. affects the whole family. And I think that's something that's very, very important to keep in mind is that patients need to know that we understand that you have a skin disease, we know you are suffering, and we're here to help you. We might not be able to cure you, but we're certainly gonna guide you on that journey. I sort of think about my role as the captain of the ship, and I need to make sure that ship is steered as steady as possible, avoiding as many of those tidal waves as we can so the patient at least feels more relaxed, more comfortable, and understands that I'm really here to support them on the journey because treating skin disease isn't a one-size-fits-all point A to point B. It's really a long-term journey. I like that analogy. That, that's very accurate. Um, what is something then that you think that patients um, should know when they're experiencing skin concerns? That's the next question from the audience. Well, I think um, having been a patient myself with atopic dermatitis, that's actually the reason why I became a dermatologist. So I can say that I think patients are the teachers. Oftentimes patients come in thinking, oh, you know, you're the dermatologist, you're the expert, you know. I've, But we are, by we, I mean, as a patient, and patients live in their own skin. Nobody knows about their skin and symptoms any better than his, her, themselves. Mm -hmm. And so they're the teachers educating um, us on their symptoms and what's worked and what doesn't work. And for us, we are learning from our patients every day. Um, the other thing I wish that my um, all my patients would know is that it's okay to get a second opinion. Mm -hmm. It's okay that if your first, second, or third dermatologist doesn't connect with you or doesn't seem familiar with your cultural background and your disease and also, you know, how to treat skin of color patients. Shop around. But I do believe that there are many good practitioners who are not of skin of color mm -hmm. that do understand skin of color disease as well. So just like finding a spouse, you may need to date around to find that true person that connects with you <laughs> and get home, you know, get you better. I love that. Dr. Farley? Yeah, no, uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, I just hope that all my patients know, you know, that as clinicians, we're all here to help them to get better. We want to try to get their condition to do as well as possible. But the last thing that we're here to do is judge. You know, because again, some of these conditions, you know, depending on where they're at in, uh, uh, you know, sensitive areas that people don't always want to show, they feel embarrassed about. Uh, uh, I always tell people, well, there's skin there too. You know, we got to look there. And it, it's nothing at all against them. And I never want my patients to ever feel judged. And I hope patients know that as clinicians, we're not here to judge them. We just, like you said, need to make sure we get a thorough history so that we know everything that's going on. But we're not ever asking these questions because we're trying to look down on them. It's just we, we ask some of these questions just because we need to know either their journey or what has helped them or not helped them in the past. And so um, I think that's important for them to know as well is that we're, we're not here to laugh at them or to make fun of them or to judge them. We're all here to be working as a team to get them feeling better. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what's something that you think patients should know about their skin concerns? Well, I think the, the most important thing that resonates for me after hearing what, what my colleague said is that you need to trust yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think advocating is the best word I can use. You know, at the beginning when I introduced myself, I talked about my passion for advocacy for physicians and our specialty. But patient advocacy is a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. And being an advocate is not only me as a doctor advocating for treatments or research or clinical trials for my patient, but it's telling my patient, be your own advocate. Uh, trust yourself and ask those questions. If, if you think you're getting the wrong answer from your pediatrician or from your primary care doc, who are probably a great doctor, but may not know skin, mm -hmm. ask them to refer you to someone. Find that skin of color specialist through the Skin of Color Society website or through the AAD and say, I know this doctor specializes in hydradenitis suppurativa mm -hmm. in Little Rock, Arkansas. I wanna go see <laughs> Dr. Shi, yeah. or, or I know Dr. Desai specializes in vitiligo. I'm willing to go to Dallas, get me a referral. Mm -hmm. These are important things that will be very helpful as you navigate your journey in healthcare. And, and you know, we live in a healthcare ecosystem that's constantly changing. You know, insurance, copays, deductibles, prescriptions, prior authorizations, a cost of medications. None of these issues are going to be solved overnight. So it's important that the patients understand 
that they have to be a part of advocating for themselves. It can't always be just the doctor telling you to go from that point A to point B. Remember, we said this is a journey. Mm -hmm. This is not a simple linear process. Sometimes in my world and in our worlds, we wish it was a linear process. <laughs> yeah. We wish our lives were easier, that we could give a patient a diagnosis, a treatment, and cure them. But unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. And so I think patients and the public awareness piece, I know I've said that probably like five times, but I'm stressing that because we want to partner with our media friends, with our industry friends, to really have patients mm -hmm. become their own advocates. Absolutely, and I think that's why we're all here today too. Um, the next question we received was, what are some steps the medical community could consider to increase education and awareness into skin of color topics among medical students or students entering into dermatology? Well, I can start with that. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's passion. Passions can be taught and do it early. You know, I wish, you know, we're in the Renaissance era now of understanding skin of color and dermatology. I was saying, you know, when I was a medical student, the textbook is very monotone and fair skin, right? So I wish I'm educating, you know, we're still learning these mm -hmm. days, but we can identify people, even pre-med, mm -hmm. medical school, any exposure they may have to dermatology um, is now, you know, more colored and, you know, um, and for the for a good reason. And Dr. Desai had mentioned that the AED and the AMA are moving towards that the entire, you know, industry is moving towards diversity and inclusivity. And so what we can do is to teach passion early on. And so when these students become residents, practitioners, and become the leaders of our field, um, then they can give back and teach back. Yeah. I love that. Just infusing that pipeline with a little bit of passion. Dr. Farley? Yeah, no, uh, uh, I agree 100%. You know, uh, you know uh, as we've talked about, you know, patients like to see uh, someone that looks like them. I think students, though, also, and residents, you know, they want to feel like wherever they go to train that it's going to be inclusive of them and will embrace them. So I think seeing other faculty members that look like them is the same thing. It makes them feel like, okay, there's someone here that's going to understand me. There's someone here that knows what I'm going through. And so um, I, I think getting uh, uh, more people excited excited about teaching and working with students, it just helps to get those students to enroll and to pursue uh, whether it's dermatology or uh, uh, any medical field. But I, I think it's also too, all those same uh, clinicians are likely going to have more patients of skin of color in their clinics as well. So then not only are you bringing in the students or residents of skin of color, but then you're also exposing all, all of your uh, people that you're teaching to patients of skin of color as well. Absolutely. Dr. Desai, anything to add on this? Well, I think, you know, when you think about dermatology as a specialty and, and you really focus on what we've accomplished to get where we are, this is the, the most competitive specialty for students to go into. And that can be very daunting. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think helps uh, our student pipeline is mentorship. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't be where I am today and, and have the privilege of being a leader in the specialty like you all without having had mentors who helped me. Right. And so giving back and helping students, if that's with a publication opportunity or a research opportunity, there are student scholarships and grants out there that students would probably not even know about if they didn't do their own research. So as I mentioned earlier, Skin of Color Society, the AAD, mm -hmm. the ASDS, many of these groups have grants, scholarships, visiting observerships that are paid for, that don't have a fiscal impact for students who are already in medical school debt but can still take advantage of dermatology opportunities. And one of the things I tell my students who are really interested in going to, into derm, but may be scared that they don't have the best scores or they don't have the best medical school rank, don't give up. If you want to be a dermatologist and help patients from a varying background and treat skin disease, you can do it. But you have to have the right amount of confidence and mentorship along the way to really guide you. So I really think that us giving back to our patients and the public like we're doing today at this session is also going in tandem with mentoring and guiding the next generation of dermatologists who will hopefully continue the work that we've already started. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's see if we have any other questions from the audience. So our next question is that, you mentioned that many patients in communities of color are hesitant to be involved in clinical trials. What strategies do you have for helping to educate these patients about the value of being involved in clinical trials? 
Can we start with you, Dr. Desai? You talked a little bit about this. Sure. I think that's a great question. <laughs> and I, I mentioned the sort of distrust that some patients uh, in communities of color and marginalized communities have. I think one of the things that I always tell my patients is don't think of the clinical trial simply as you're being experimented on. <laughs> Remember that by the time you get into a phase three clinical trial, these medications that are being investigated have, have already undergone robust testing before it even gets to the point where it can be used on a patient in a clinical trial. So what I tell my patients who come in is, you have a skin disease, you also have an insurance that's not gonna cover anything that's gonna make you get better. You probably have been suffering. Let's try this clinical trial where you can get an investigational drug at no cost to you. You get compensated for being in the clinical trial. You're helping the future healthcare community and others who are suffering and we're trying something that has already been safety tested mm -hmm. under multiple phase one and phase two steps before it even gets to the point where I can enroll a patient. And I don't think patients truly think that. Yeah. I think sometimes they think a clinical trial, I'm gonna give them something that I'm just you know, pulling out of a box that I'm just hoping works. And that's partially true that we hope the drug works in a study, but remember, in order to get to a phase three study, there are rigorous steps that take place before that even happens. Mm -hmm. Phase four studies are ones where you already have an FDA approved product, let's say, and I wanna test it for a different indication mm -hmm. or on a, on a different sort of case scenario. So a lot of times just that five minute discussion mm -hmm. and that sort of light bulb goes off with the patient, oh, I had no idea right. that this has already been used. This has already been studied. Now you're just using it for my psoriasis, but this drug was already approved for atopic dermatitis. You just wanna see how it helps me. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get a drug anyway, so this is gonna be one of the ways to do that. Yeah, that's very important. Understanding those phases, because a lot of patients don't, don't get the safety right. part of it. Um, we did, Anything else to add on that particular one? Um, either Dr. Farley or Dr. Shee? Okay. No, I think Dr. Desai hit it. I think also, too, it, it's important to bring up that, uh, uh, you know, that in the past, because uh, trials were so uh, monotonous in as far as their overall racial diversity, you know, it makes it also very hard to see, like, oh, does a given uh, group of patients tend to respond better to one medication versus mm -hmm. the other? But again, the only way we can know it is through the data. So, like, right. if you start seeing that, like, a given group of people, you know, like, you know, Hispanics respond to, the, or, you know, whatever, it, it, it helps you to, then when we're treating more patients in the future, then we can even shift our algorithms a little bit to make sure that we give patients the best treatment that is truly going to work for them. Yeah, absolutely. Very true. Our next question is, what advice do you have for dermatologists, for dermatologists and patients to know when it comes to treating patients of color? So both for the dermatologists and the patients. Um, let's start with you, Dr. Shi. Sure. Uh, we kind of talked about um, the advice for dermatologists, mm -hmm. you know, recognizing how things present differently, uh, some of the expectations, and being able to grade severity, right? But coming from a patient's perspective, I think it's important that we know um, how certain medications that we use can have potential adverse effects, mm -hmm. right? Or what to expect. I'll give you an example. Topical corticosteroid is probably kind of the pillar treatment that we have in dermatology for many chronic inflammatory conditions historically, and probably still now. Um, when we use topical steroids in people who are more richly pigmented over time, there may be a you know a potential of having this pigmentation or hypopigmentation where the color you know around the applications that becomes a little bit lighter than usual. And if we don't educate our patients that this is an expected side effect and that can be reversible right over time, then that can be very daunting. And patients who are applying this cream hoping to get their rash better, for example, is getting something, some, a color change. And that's scary. And so it's important that we work together to identify, to be knowledgeable, one, about these side effects, and two, to take the time to explain to that. And three, expectant management. If a patient were to call telling my group, whether it's the resident, the medical assistant, the nurse, that they're experiencing these unique side effects because of their skin color, then we need to be able to manage that and educate patient to kind of soothe their anxiety. And this way they can gain confidence about the treatment and stay on the treatment and adherent to, uh, be adherent to them and have the best treatment outcome. Absolutely, and we have a related question. Do you have any advice for dermatologists and how they can foster positive relationships with patients. 
Um, Dr. Farley, let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, no, uh, again, I, I really think that it's all down to communication. You know, that open uh, uh, dermatologist patient relationship is just so essential to giving the best care possible. When people feel like they're heard and they're able to give their experiences, then, then that helps them to listen to the clinician as well and not just feeling like they're being talked at or being lectured to. Um, uh, uh, I think the other thing too that's important is um, you know, recognizing, so let's say for instance for a given condition, uh, someone's being prescribed a, a shampoo, but they may not, they only might wash their hair once a week or twice a week. So depending on the severity of the condition, well, shampoo may not be the best option, but a lot of times uh, uh, those treatments will come in different formulations. So you could prescribe it in an ointment or a lotion or a cream. But so I think it's important on both ends. Like me as a clinician, I, I try to ask my patients that um, just to make sure that I'm giving them something that's going to work. But I think also as a patient, if what you're being prescribed doesn't seem like, well, I only wash my hair once a week, so do you think this is going to work? I, I, I think it's important to voice those concerns because someone may not have thought of that, and then they can be like, oh, no, you know what, let me change it to this. It works the same, but now you can use it more often. You know, I, I, I think just that open relationship is the big thing. I think that's huge. Um, I encounter that a lot with my alopecia patients. You really have to listen to what their preferences are in terms of formulation because um, that's going to help with the compliance as well. Um, we have another question, and slightly related here, too, on the topic of treatment. We talked a lot about how conditions present differently. We talked about education, experience. We didn't talk about access as much. So the question is, what advice do you have for a patient having issues with access to treatment? Um, let's start with you, Dr. Desai. Well, access is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. You know, access to care, access to a board-certified dermatologist, and then ultimately access to treatment. And I think one of the things that I encourage patients to get involved with is the political advocacy piece mm -hmm. as a patient. So, you know, as a dermatologist who's passionate about political advocacy, I'm in Washington frequently talking to, to lawmakers and policymakers about why I need this treatment for my patient. But I don't, the message coming from me as a doctor oftentimes sounds like a broken record. But if you have a patient who has psoriasis or hydradenitis suppurativa sharing their patient story, that I'm suffering, I can't get a job, I can't get out of bed, I have low self-esteem, I'm depressed, and I need help, I think access from a patient advocacy message is critical. Mm -hmm. I'll just give you an example. A few years ago, we held the first ever uh, advocacy day in Washington at the Capitol with 20 patients suffering from vitiligo mm -hmm. and two of us as physician experts. The first time ever, we had 20 vitiligo patients spend an entire day on Capitol Hill. So you can imagine you go into a senator's office and I'm giving my physician expertise, but then you have three patients of color who have large white patches all over their face sharing that same message. Whose story is more impactful, right. mine or the patient's? And it, it's the patient's story. Yep. <laughs> so I'm there to sort of back up the patient. Uh, I'm almost the, the standing in the background of the wings of the play. They're the starring actor in that show. So I think one of the keys of access to therapies is letting patients know that they need to help us as physicians write those elected officials, call your insurances, make sure you talk to your state uh, insurance board. These are ways that we can move the pendulum and move the needle. Now that's more from a kind of global perspective. On a day-to-day -day perspective, I think one of the challenges with access is uh, we as doctors have to kind of jump through a lot of hoops. Dr. Shi and I were talking about this this morning. And so one of the challenges and one of the ways patients can advocate for access is to really help us uh, navigate that journey with other medications they may have been on before. So I think it's a complex pathway, yeah. but these are some things that I'm truly passionate about for access to care. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that insight. And I think we can all take away a bit from that. Um, we have some more questions. One is related to HS, which Dr. Shi, I would love if you would take this one. It says, do you see changes in education of medical students for HS? I'm so glad that I got this question. The, the, the answer is capital letters, yes. Um, we, like I said, we're in the Renaissance era of understanding HS. And um, as part of the HS Foundation, we now have mentorship grants and research grants. And some of them are dedicated to early career residents and medical students to apply. And the mentorship is really 
really awesome in a way where you can be paired with an HS expert. Um, it doesn't have to be one of the board members, but somebody who runs an HS specialty clinic as well. There's a small stipend that you can apply for and actually go to the site to learn everything about HS, whether it's medications, whether it's procedurals, anything. And I, I thought that would be, you know, kind of similar to what I said earlier, passions can be taught early on. And through these mentorships and education opportunities comes research ideas, comes research projects. It betters their application for dermatology and beyond and hopefully they get to where they need to be in their career and then they're in a position to inspire changes for future medical students and trainees so we are like dr uh, samal uh, has said you know like we are really moving the needle right mm -hmm. yeah so um help us you know get more funding not just to, in educating hs but for all dermatologic diseases in general I love that, and I didn't know. I learned something new. So uh, apply for that mentorship if you're yes, interested. Yes, we look forward to receiving your application. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and I think we have time for one last question. Um, and so let's go to this. In addition to racial considerations, have you encountered any cultural sensitivities that you feel all dermatologists should be aware of when diagnosing and treating patients of color? Um, who is interested in taking this? Um, Dr. Yeah, no, to me, I, I, again, you know, uh, going back to that cultural competency, you know, mm -hmm. so some patients, um, uh, uh, depending on uh, uh, if they're your same gender or not, may not feel comfortable showing certain parts of their bodies mm -hmm. to you, you know, mm -hmm. or, um, uh, uh, and so if that happens, you know, which it, it does occasionally, you know, then you can uh, either, A, again, try to assure them as much as possible, like, I'm, I'm not here to judge, I'm not, like, we're not, this is just, truly medically, clinically trying to help you, but certainly you have to respect everyone's wishes, you know, so then um, if not, then you have someone else come in the, the, the room to do, you know, like the thing is to me to uh, really get our patients to feel as comfortable as possible with their um, uh, uh, medical treatments because that's what's going to get them to that finish line to, to get things treated. So I think it's taking everything into consideration and doing everything we can just to make them feel as comfortable as possible. Perfect. Yep. And Dr. Desai, anything to add on this one? No, I completely agree. I think that comfort level is really important. I think also, you know, in a multicultural society we live with, language is oftentimes a barrier. And so one of the things that I like to do now, we, you know, we have Google Translate mm -hmm. all the time. I always like to kind of figure out what the background of that patient is and maybe just give them a quick greeting yeah. in their own language. It takes about two seconds and it just completely changes the tone and vibe in the room. Um, so I think kind of relating to that patient the best you can uh, works very, very nicely. And I, I do think cultural competency is a very important part now of many medical school educational curriculum. So it's nice to know. We did a little bit of that when I was in medical school, but I know now when I work with students at UT Southwestern and other institutions, cultural competency has become a big part of that. So I completely agree with what Dr. Farley said. Amazing. Well, I would like to thank each and every one of the panelists here today um, for their fantastic contribution to this conversation. Um, this brings us to the end of our panel on screen and in the event program. You'll see organizations and links to resources to learn more about skin conditions we talked about today. And as a reminder, if you loved one, if you're, if you or a loved one thinks you may have a skin condition, or if you loved what we talked about, um, please reach out to a medical provider. We are here to support you. We're here to educate you, and we're going to take a short break here in return for our second session, moderated by my colleague Dr. Desai, and go into patient and caregiver experiences. So with that, we'll see you soon, and thank you again.